great pleasure to be here and really uh, great to see some people who I've known for quite a while, like John Bartlett sitting at the back there. And thanks to Kathy and, and Mike for the very warm and uh, generous reception over the last couple of days. Um, so I'm going to be spending a bit of time telling you uh, today about some of the mental health research networks that we're involved in and that we've been in, in the University of Cape Town and uh, hoping to try and draw out some lessons that may be of interest to you in terms of building research networks, building capacity for research in low- and middle-income countries, and also making sure that the research that we do is relevant, that it's aligned with uh, policy priorities in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, so just a brief uh, overview. Uh, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about these three uh, major collaborations that we're involved in. PRIME, which stands for the Program for Improving Mental Health Care, uh, AFFIRM, which is the Africa focus on intervention research for mental health, and EMERALD, which stands for Emerging Mental Health Systems in Low- and Middle-Income Countries. Uh, believe it or not, EMERALD does actually stand for that. <laughs> One of the new innovations in global mental health is that you don't have to take the first letter from every word. You can choose at random, so you can uh, probably get some nice answers. So um, again, as I said, I'm going to try and draw out some lessons uh, from this in terms of partnerships, in terms of capacity building, and in terms of uh, policy alignment. So uh, it's really an exciting time to be involved in this field of global mental health research. Um, there really is growing policy recognition and, and evidence that wasn't there um, some uh, 15 years ago when I started uh, working for WHO and working in this field. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know the WHO MH Gap Intervention Guide. It's, it's a clinical guideline that was developed for use by primary healthcare workers, uh, predominantly in low and middle income countries, and uh, really provides a science and symptoms approach to help primary care practitioners to diagnose and treat uh, common mental health problems. And it's now been scaled up for use in over 80 countries, having just been published for the first time in 2010, which is a massive growth. Um, and the new edition is now being uh, revised in 2015-2016. In, uh, uh, in 2013, the WHO and all its member states committed themselves to a global mental health action plan with very clear targets and indicators up to the year 2020. Um, and then just this week, uh, the World Bank and the WHO are holding a, a joint meeting called uh, Out of the Shadows, making mental health a global development priority. And for the World Bank to take this on, I think, is a huge step uh, forward. Now, for those of you who are interested, the 2015 World Development Report is titled Mind, Society and Behavior, and really focuses a great deal on behavior change and how important it is uh, to understand behavior and cognitions in the context of trying to alleviate poverty. So uh, there's growing movement uh, among the World Bank group towards taking mental health more seriously uh, as a public health and development uh, policy issue. There's also been unprecedented research funding in low- and middle-income countries in the last five years or so. So the NIMH have established regional hubs for intervention research in South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia. Grand Challenges Canada have poured some 32 million Canadian dollars into research in low-income countries. The EU has funded a major research collaboration. Wellcome Trust has been funding I think for many years now, um, innovative research led by people like Vikram Patel and Antti Brachman and Ricardo Araya. And UK Aid, or the Department for International Development in the UK, has also <coughs> contributed significant funding. So on the whole, it's an exciting time to be working in this field. Uh, but I think uh, there are some uh, reasons for caution and reasons to reflect on the process at the stage. First of all, we need to think carefully about how do we ensure the sustainability of our research partnerships and research collaborations. Um, there have been fads uh, in particular funding areas. I think there's been a huge growth in HIV funding over the last while, but we've seen sort of some of that start to tail off. Um, and unless we build really solid capacity and sustainable uh, partnerships um, in low- and middle-income countries, uh, there's a great danger that some of the traction and some of the gains we've made may be lost. Um, secondly, how do we strengthen research capacity in low- and middle-income countries to enable those countries to be leaders in the field? And it makes sense that they are leaders because that is where the work, that is where the research, and that is where the interventions are not being delivered. Um, thirdly, how do we balance the local and the global? There's been quite a strong criticism of global mental health from some quarters that in the interests of focusing on the global, the global burden of disease, 
scaling up mental health services, we overlook what is local, what is locally relevant, how people in local settings understand their distress. And so I think it's very important that we incorporate local idioms of distress and a very sensitive approach to cross-cultural mental health uh, into our global efforts. And then, of course, there are still so many huge gaps, and uh, child and adolescent mental health is, is one which I think has really been underfunded. And it's been great to speak to some of the people here in the Duke uh, Global Health Institute, especially working on child and adolescent mental health this morning, to hear about these very exciting new initiatives. And I think this is a huge gap where Duke could potentially play a, a leadership role. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about some of these collaborations, and I hope it will give you some, a feel of, of some of the work that we're doing, and then I'm going to try and draw out the lessons from this. Uh, I'm going to talk about Prime first. Uh, so this is a screenshot from our uh, Prime website. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you could Google Prime. Um, there are various permutations of this term, Prime, primates. Uh, uh, so you, know, you can use it as, as, as you want. But really the focus is on uh, taking known cost-effective interventions and looking at the, how do we scale these up to larger populations. So in each country, in Ethiopia, India, Nepal, South Africa, and Uganda, we've taken one district demonstration site and uh, worked with local uh, partners to develop district mental health care plans and then evaluate those. Um, and I'll tell you more about that. So this is a, a picture of our latest annual meeting. Every year we meet in one of the partner countries, and it really is a fantastic group. It's uh, local implementers, uh, people in research institutions. Uh, we have uh, two research directors, uh, Victor Patel and Mark Tomlinson. Um, I have this funny title of being a CEO, a psychologist, so I don't know what to do, but that's my role. And then in each country, we have a, a research a principal investigator and a Ministry of Health partner. And our overall purpose is really to generate high-quality research on the implementation and scaling up of treatment programs for priority uh, mental disorders in primary healthcare settings, but also in maternal healthcare settings uh, in low-resource countries. So the uh, collaboration is led from our Center for Public Mental Health at the University of Cape Town. And uh, we have certain cross-cutting partners in the World Health Organization, uh, with involvement from Sheikha Saxena, who's the Director of Mental Health and Substance Abuse at the WHO, and Dan Chisholm, who's a health economist at, at WHO. Uh, the Center for Global Mental Health, which includes the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and King's College. And then uh, a really innovative uh, NGO called Basic Needs, which works in the <coughs> low income industry, and the Perinatal Mental Health Projects, uh, given our focus on maternal mental health. And then, as I mentioned, in each country, we have an academic partner and a Ministry of Health partner. And we try to ensure that at every annual meeting, the Ministry of Health partner and the academic partner attend. And uh, what is a real strength of Prime is that each of the country partners are actually leaders in their own right. So it's not as though we are sitting in Cape Town and really trying to direct the research enterprise. It's driven really by the country teams. And uh, we meet on a monthly basis in a, what we call a principal investigator uh, teleconference, and then quarterly with a, a more elaborate teleconference, and then uh, annually in each of the country sites. And Vikram, I think, really captures it well when he says here, yeah, the most exciting thing about Prime is the fact that ministries of health in five countries and the WHO have joined mental health research leaders as equal partners. <coughs> in fact, before we even got the funding, we were given some seed funding by DIPID when we reached the final round to have a meeting to plan our grant. And we made sure that we invited all the ministries of health along and we asked them, what is your research priority? What are, you, what are the questions that you have and how can we try and answer those? So these partnerships are, are really important. So some of the principles that we've uh, used in, in developing this program have been, first of all, the starting point that we know a reasonable amount about what works. So it's not a question of evaluating whether an intervention is cost-effective. It's more the how question. How, how do we take known cost-effective interventions and scale them up in teen to low-resource settings? Um, I've mentioned the point about partnership. We focus on certain priority conditions, uh, depression, alcohol use disorders, uh, psychosis, and then in three of the countries, epilepsy. 
And we've tried to develop mental health care plans that aren't only focused on the health facility level, aren't only focused on clinics, but also go one level below to the community level <coughs> and one level above to the healthcare care organization level, working closely with district health managers uh, to develop these plans. Uh, the methodological framework we've used is the MRC framework for evaluation of complex uh, interventions, and we've used an approach called theory of change, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a moment. And we really are focusing on key disadvantaged groups, the poor women and people living with mental illness. And if you're wanting to know more about this, uh, the overall approach, we've, we've published a paper in Cross Medicine uh, on this. Uh, this framework really, I hope, uh, sets a sort of context that we understand poverty and mental health as being related in a cyclical uh, way. So conditions of poverty and all the adversity which goes with this set up a number of uh, adverse uh, circumstances which then increase risk for a range of mental health problems. And this is what's often called the social causation pathway. And then in turn, mental illness, because of the disability associated with it, and because of the increased health expenditure associated with uh, mental illness, leads to a drift into poverty or people remaining in poverty during the course of their lives. And this is often called the social drift pathway. So really, if we want to develop interventions that break the cycle, we need to have interventions that target both pathways. We can't just provide treatment because the circumstances of poverty will perpetuate and maintain mental health problems. Um, so we've really tried to think about this in designing our mental health care plans. We provide treatment, certainly, in terms of antipsychotic medication and psychosocial rehabilitation for schizophrenia uh, and similarly for depression and alcohol use disorders. But we've also tried to look at ways of including livelihoods generation, improving access to social grants where these are available, setting up user self-help support groups, um, and to some extent social psychosocial rehabilitation uh, addresses this. So really what are the poverty uh, drivers that we can intervene in that might act as uh, prevention uh, interventions to prevent mental illness? Uh, the main intervention tool is uh, something called the WHO MH GAF guideline, which I, I think I mentioned earlier on. And we really try to adapt this to different settings, translating it to local settings. In some countries, we've gone a, to another step further, which is to really revamp it and integrate it into a general primary health care guideline. For example, in South Africa, we're using something called the Primary Care 101 guide, which is an integrated uh, signs and symptoms approach to the management of common mental illness, <coughs> not common mental illness, common illness in primary care settings. Um, so that's been a really important part of the formative work that we've done. And uh, here is a slide just showing some of the different country sites. Uh, so as I mentioned, one district uh, in each country, quite diverse in terms of the size of the population, the number of primary health care clinics, the socioeconomic characteristics, and, and also the number of specialists. So in Ethiopia, there are no specialists in the Soto district, so that poses a very interesting question for us. How do you deliver a mental health service without any mental health practitioners? Um, through to South Africa, which is relatively well resourced. And we purposefully chose quite diverse settings because we wanted to try and generate lessons. So Nepal, for example, is a post-conflict fragile state and poses a, a number of really important challenges around governance and uh, scaling up of, of uh, mental health services. Here are some pictures from some of the sites. Uh, the top left-hand corner is the uh, Ethiopia Soto district. Uh, this is the Kamuli district in Uganda. This is our Ministry of Health partner, Dr. Sheila Ndianabanji, uh, who's been absolutely amazing in supporting our work. Uh, this is the Kamuli district hospital, also in Uganda. And this is the Sehor district uh, in Madhya Pradesh state in India. So we basically have uh, three phases in PRIME. The first phase is what we, we call an inception phase, where we're about establishing partnerships with, with each of the uh, uh, country teams and with the local stakeholders, and we did very detailed situation analyses. Um, Charlotte Hanlon has published a very nice uh, paper. If any of you are interested in doing district-level mental health situation analyses for your own research or projects you're involved in, she's developed a great tool, uh, which you can download and is freely available. Uh, which really tries to assess some of the key uh, structural uh, things which need to be in place for, for mental health services at a district level uh, in low and middle income countries. We then went through a process of developing mental health care plans, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. And 
for the last uh, three years or so, we've been implementing them and evaluating them. And we now are reaching a stage where we're about year five in the, uh, in the overall project of scaling up. And uh, that's taking different forms in, in different countries. So uh, I want to say a bit more about this theory of change approach because I think it's a, a really exciting, quite novel, quite new uh, way of trying to collaboratively develop plans and also develop uh, evaluation <coughs> designs. So we initially, in uh, one of our cross-country meetings in Goa in 2011, uh, developed a theory of change for the whole prime consortium and how we thought it would work. So basically, a uh, theory of change is a way of mapping the causal steps in an intervention that lead to the desired income, your outcome, sorry, you hope to, to achieve. Um, and in the, co in the context of a group, it's done in a very pragmatic way using uh, sticky notes. So you, you stick up on the wall uh, what you hope to achieve, and then you map out uh, all the steps that um, should be in place from the point at which you enter the system to achieve the outcome that you want. Um, there's a very nice thing you can see here just behind Abu Bar's head is this thing called the ceiling of accountability. So there's some things which are beyond our control, and we hope that if we put certain conditions in place, we will achieve the outcome, but some things that we can't have control over. And what it does do, which I think is extremely useful, is it makes you think very carefully about your assumptions, about what you think will work all the way along the causal pathway. So if, for example, you are training primary healthcare nurses to detect depression and alcohol use disorders in primary care clinics, there are a whole lot of assumptions around whether that would work or not. Are they even interested? Do they have the time? Are the facilities available? Uh, would you be able to sustain supervision? If they were to detect, who would they refer to? So all of those things need to be mapped out with a, a fairly good deal of clarity before you go into the field. And this is a really a great tool for doing this. Um, it also allows you to then attach to each of the assumptions along the way uh, indicators to measure whether that particular uh, step has been achieved. And on the basis of those indicators, you can then develop an evaluation framework, which is exactly what we've done with Prime. And, um, for those of you who are interested in this, uh, Erica Breuer, who's one of my PhD students working at the University of Cape Town as a project manager, has uh, published uh, her, she's working on her PhD on this, and she's published this very nice paper on using workshops to develop theories of change in five low and middle income countries. This is in the International Journal of Mental Health Systems. Um, and then subsequently, in January this year, we published a supplement to the British Journal of Psychiatry with uh, 10 articles which sets up this method in more detail, um, but uh, linking it to an evaluation, the overall prime evaluation design. And really this is doing what uh, these two mathematicians are trying to do here. So they're looking at all these formula and the miracle occurs, blah, blah, blah. So one guy says, I think you should be more excited here in step two. And, uh, I think it's a really important lesson for those of us involved in intervention design. We really need to think very, very carefully about all the steps along the way and be clear about what are the causal mechanisms uh, in the process. So then what we did was we then mapped on <coughs> all these different things in the theory of change onto an overall planning framework. And, and as I mentioned, this <coughs> happens at three levels. The healthcare organization, which is the district health management team. The health facility, which is the uh, primary care clinics and the district hospital. And then the community. So for each level, we have a number of different packages, and these are really just illustrative. Um, the actual plans are much more detailed, and I've put them up, you wouldn't be able to read them at the back. So this is really just to illustrate. So for healthcare organization, for management, we need to build capacity to plan mental health services, and we also need to build indicators in the health information system to be able to help us to track mental health uh, service delivery. And similarly for the other <coughs> levels. Okay, so then how did we go about evaluating all of this? So, so really we needed to have a, a multidisciplinary approach to, to the evaluation design. First of all, we conducted a situation analysis, as I mentioned earlier on, and uh, Charlotte Hanlon, Hanlon from the Addis Ababa University uh, really led this work. Uh, so have a look at that if you're interested. Secondly, we wanted to establish whether by introducing <coughs> these training programs in the clinics, uh, primary care staff were more able to detect people with depression and alcohol use disorders. So we've done repeat facility detection surveys in each of the clinics 
looking at the proportion of people who screen positive for depression and alcohol use disorders uh, who are correctly diagnosed and treated, and looking at the extent to which that improves over time. So these are facility detection surveys. <coughs> Thirdly, uh, we are doing repeat community surveys because we're really interested in how do we narrow this treatment gap. Uh, we know that very few people who live with a mental health problem in low and middle income countries, uh, the estimates are between 25% and around 10% in countries in Ethiopia actually receive treatment. So if we roll out a district mental health care plan, can we narrow that treatment gap? Can we increase the proportion of people who are actually receiving care or, or increase the contact coverage? So we've done a representative community survey in each district, uh, spaced uh, about three years apart, and we'll be doing follow-ups in the next few months to look at whether we can make a dent on the treatment gap. Um, fourthly, we are also interested in individual outcomes. There's no point in doing these elaborate plans if it doesn't make a difference in anybody's individual lives. So we're following cohorts of people with psychosis, epilepsy, alcohol use disorders, and depression over a one-year period to see if their symptoms and also their functioning and their economic circumstances improve. And what we've done with the Emerald study, which I'll tell you a bit more about later, is that we've linked uh, the Emerald study to Prime in this, in this instance and followed up the households to see if there's an impact on household economic outcomes as well. So those are the cohort studies. And then fifthly, we are really interested in the nuts and bolts of how this works. Uh, how many people are trained? How many supervision sessions happen? how many people have received treatment, how many people have been referred, and so on. So the case study really sets out all the indicators for that. So just to try and summarize, we've taken the theory of change, we've latched indicators onto each of the steps of the theory of change, and then from those indicators we put together our evaluation design. And then what we've done finally, and Dan Chisholm has really uh, really led this work from the WHO, <coughs> he's uh, adapted the MHGAP costing tool to the prime country. So we now have estimates of what the human resource requirements would be for scaling up these packages of care to a much larger population, and then also what it would cost, the total cost per capita, and we have uh, breakdowns by disorder groups. Um, yeah. These are just illustrative. Um, the Final data are published in that uh, British Journal of Psychiatry uh, series, which I mentioned earlier on. <coughs> and then uh, what we've thought has been a really important part of the work of Prime is really building capacity. So we've certainly done work building capacity for managers and service providers, and this is really the substance of the mental health care plans in each district. But we've also uh, put a lot of effort into building capacity of researchers. So several of our staff teach on our master's programs. There's an MSc in Global Mental Health at uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine at King's College. And we have an MPhil in Public Mental Health at UCT and Stellenbosch. Uh, there's also a PhD program at Addis Ababa University. And I think about six or seven of their PhD <coughs> students are using prime data to, to do their PhDs. Um, and we have a total of 13 PhDs registered with Prime. Um, Please to say that uh, women outnumber men here. And uh, three master students have also been using Prime <coughs> to conduct their research. We also try and tack on uh, short courses to our annual meetings, for example, in academic writing or in systematic literature reviews. So we really try and embed mentorship and ongoing capacity building in the research process. And it's starting to show some fruit, so uh, we're seeing a greater proportion of uh, people who come from the country teams who are leading papers in the consortium over time, um, which is really very encouraging, although there are ongoing challenges of uh, finding time for people to write and publish while they also are implementing the studies and uh, obviously a field work. <coughs> um, but also we're seeing a greater proportion of our peer-reviewed publications um, uh, involving country authors. And this is up to just year four, but I know that in year five it jumps up quite a bit. Um, so the, those are some of the markers that we're using to try and assess uh, country team uh, leadership and involvement in the publications. Okay, so that's all about Prime. Um, I'm not going to spend as much time on talking about the other projects, but I hope uh, some of the, the principles of some of our approaches will carry through into this. 
The second study I want to describe to you today is, is called AFFIRM, which stands for the Africa Focus on Intervention Research for Mental Health. And uh, this is a, a study funded by the National Institute of Mental Health in the USA. Uh, the NIMH have funded five of these regional hubs, uh, two in Sub-Saharan Africa, and AFFIRM is one of those two. There are also two in South America and uh, one in South Asia. So the overall goal of a firm is to improve the delivery of cost-effective mental health interventions in Africa. And we have four main aims which serve that uh, overall goal. The first is to conduct research on narrowing the treatment gap. The second is to build capacity for research. The third is to uh, strengthen networks for collaboration. And the fourth is to collaborate with uh, the other regional hubs. So um, this is a, a map of some of the sites of partners in the firm. Um, so the red circles uh, denote research sites. So we're doing two randomized controlled trials, one in Cape Town in South Africa, um, and one in uh, Ethiopia, just south of Addis Ababa in the Putajira district. And then the blue circles represent our capacity development partners. So each of these capacity development partners sends uh, one student per year to attend our MPhil program in public mental health. So we have five fellowship students, five fellowships per year over a five-year period. Um, and then the green circle is a shared uh, project, which is being shared with the other collaborative hubs um, that I mentioned earlier. And this is just a picture of the first annual meeting of all the hubs together. Um, really the driving force uh, behind all of this has been Pamela Collins, who I think some of you may know. She's the head of the Office of Disparities in Global Mental Health at the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, and I think it's been quite visionary in, in putting all of this together. And uh, it's really a fantastic group of people from each of the uh, hubs um, who, who are involved in this. Uh, so the Ethiopian trial is a, is a really interesting piece of work. It's being led by uh, Dr. Charlotte Hanlon and uh, Abeba Fikadu at the uh, Addis Ababa University. Uh, really quite a unique setting there where they have a cohort of people with severe mental illness who were identified in the early 2000s and have now been tra tracked for about 12 or 13 years uh, living with severe mental illness. I think the original cohort was about 900 people. And they now have around 600 left who are now being enrolled uh, in the trial. Um, and the idea is to establish whether people with severe mental disorder who receive mental health care that's task shared with primary health care achieve non-inferior outcomes to a specialist service. So it's a non-inferiority uh, randomized control trial. Now, why is this such a critical question? Well, the WHO and, and many international uh, advocates for mental health are really pushing this idea of task sharing or task shifting, that is using non-specialist health providers to deliver mental health care. But we don't really have convincing evidence that it doesn't lead to a dilution of treatment or to inferior outcomes uh, for people who receive that form of care. So this is really testing that hypothesis and uh, we're following up uh, this cohort of people with severe mental illness over 12 months, that's the primary endpoint, but eventually over 18 months as well. And it's been a very challenging, uh, but also fascinating trial. Uh, in South Africa, uh, and this is where I come from, uh, so our trial is based in uh, Kailicha, which is a large, very urban settlement on the outskirts of, of Cape Town. And our aim is to evaluate the cost effectiveness of a task sharing intervention using community health workers to provide counseling. So again, really testing this hypothesis, can we use uh, non-specialist providers to deliver cost-effective mental health intervention. Because potentially, if we can, uh, we can potentially scale up to a much larger population uh, cost-effective intervention. And we're working in two clinics, the Michael Mapangwana and the uh, Saint clinics in Kailicha. We did a lot of formative research similar to PRIME, uh, running theories of change, uh, workshops and consulting with local stakeholders, uh, piloting the intervention. And we're now at a point where we are doing the final 12-month uh, postnatal follow-ups uh, for, the, for the trial. Here are some scenes from uh, Kailicha, really a large, uh, impoverished community uh, on the outskirts of, of Kailicha. And in the bottom picture here, you can see uh, the Michael Mapamwai <coughs> clinic. This is the actual uh, day hospital here. And attached to it is what we call a, 
uh, midwife obstetric unit where mothers come for their antenatal bookings and also to deliver their babies. And this is really because we have quite a high uptake of, of antenatal care in South Africa, this is a really good opportunity to, uh, to screen for mental health problems and to provide uh, brief interventions uh, when necessary. Uh, so a little bit more about the capacity building component of a firm. Uh, we offer these uh, fellowships, uh, as I mentioned, five per year. And uh, over the course of the five years, a firm will come to an end at the end of 2016. Uh, we've managed to enroll five uh, students every year. Um, and as you can see from the lower uh, rows, uh, we've had uh, 12 students graduate. Of those, eight have been a firm fellow so far. And uh, we've had fairly low dropout rates, which I think is, is not bad, uh, given that students come to us for three weeks and then return to their own countries to do their research. Um, and it's really been a, an incredibly rewarding process, very, very dynamic group, often of young students working uh, early in their careers who are keen and very, very committed to mental health in sub-Saharan Africa. And every year we have a, a great group. Uh, very, very nice this year we had uh, James and Gorcha join us. Uh, from KCMC uh, for the first time, and we're hoping we can strengthen that partnership as well in the future. And then what we've done similar to, um, to PRIME is that we've tried to embed PhD students in our research process. So we have uh, four PhD students linked to the trials, um, and we also have a PhD student uh, linked to the shared project uh, component in Ethiopia. And this is just a picture from our, our most recent uh, annual meeting. Okay, and then finally, the Emerald Project. I'm just going to uh, give you two or three slides on the Emerald Project. The Emerald Project is really uh, built on the Prime Project, and then it involves many of the same uh, country partners, but also adds the country of Nigeria. This is something that we don't lead from the University of Cape Town. It's led by Professor Graham Thornycroft from King's College. Um, but it's essentially focused on health <coughs> systems, and how do we strengthen health systems to improve uh, mental health outcomes. So it has uh, three main objectives. The first is focused on health financing. So how do we ensure that there are adequate, fair, and sustainable resources for mental health systems? So Dan Chisholm um, has led the work on this, developing a costing tool for scaling up mental health services. The second is really focused on governance of, of mental health services. So how do we integrate services into general health care settings? And this is led by Inga Peterson and, and Fred Kigorzi from Uganda uh, and South Africa. And the third is how do we measure uh, coverage and, and goal attainment. And this is work led by Oya Gureja and Mark Jordans uh, from Nigeria and Nepal, respectively. And uh, this is really trying to develop indicators to integrate mental health into health management information systems. And then we have work packages which support these overall objectives focused on project management, on capacity building as well, and on dissemination of our, our findings. And this is the Emerald Group, one of our early meetings. Okay, so what have we learned from all of this? Um, and I really want to try and uh, draw out some, some lessons around three main themes. The first theme is around partnerships. And this is really an absolutely critical part of this whole uh, enterprise. And for those of you who are interested in developing a career in this work, it really is a, it's a team sport. It's, it's something that we do together. There are no individual stars who, who uh, you know, do their own thing and lead work on their own. Um, my head of department, uh, Professor Dan Stein, often speaks about myths around research, and he compares his, himself as a Stein with one of the other Steins, Einstein. And he said, there's this myth that research is about people sitting on their own and coming up with thought experiments and solving big problems in that way. And really, a lot of the research that we do is really about working in teams and working together with multiple stakeholders, people from ministries of health, NGOs, uh, private donors, academic institutions, service users, and primary care practitioners. And uh, some of the principles around this are really trying to build relationships over the long term. So building trust. Uh, if you come from a high-income country, uh, you may find that your initial uh, response, if you're approaching people in low-income countries to work with you, uh, may not necessarily be welcome you with, with open arms. They've probably been approached by many people in the past. Um, and it's really about establishing friendships and relationships over time. And that's based on trust. It's based on a two-way partnership. 
And I think uh, many of that, much of that is embodied in the way in which the Duke Global Health Institute works. So the partnership with KCMC in, in Tanzania is really exemplary. It's been building the relationship over time, working in ways that benefit both partners in a, in a very mutual and equal way. Um, and this is the kind of uh, principle which I think is, is really important. The second principle is one of focus. It's, it's often very tempting to have uh, many partnerships with multiple uh, stakeholders. Um, and it's really, really important to choose your partners and to stick with them for the long term. Sometimes you might have disagreements, you might have fallouts. Uh, but uh, like any good marriage, you end up uh, completing each other's sentences in the end. You know? So it's, it's really worth uh, sticking it out uh, despite uh, difficulties or differences which do occur along the way. Um, and uh, I think the fourth point is to build capacity building assessments in early into the enterprise. So think carefully about what are the capacity building needs in the local setting, what are your own capacity building needs, uh, what, what do I need to learn from this whole process, and uh, working out ways of, of uh, clearly establishing those goals and clarifying expectations early on. Uh, we've done some work thinking about how do you uh, conceptualize capacity building in global mental health research, and this is a very nice paper led by Graham Thornycroft, which speaks about the importance of both institutional capacity building and individual capacity building. So I think it's very important not just to give fellowships to the star performers or to certain individuals who may or may not stick around, but really to focus also, um, and th that's an important component, but also to focus on building institutions. So uh, setting up or working with centers or units, uh, investing in low and middle income countries' capacity to teach themselves and to build capacity themselves, and setting up joint projects, collaborations, uh, including uh, people very early on the stage. Uh, I've had people approach me from high income countries when a grant proposal is almost ready to be submitted and saying to me, will you partner with me? And that doesn't feel like an, an equal collaboration. Um, so I think getting with people early on in the process, finding out what are their needs and working together to develop a grant proposal is really the way to go. And then in terms of individuals, it's very important to think about the career trajectory and, and uh, building capacity at the particular stage people are at. And people have different needs at devel different developmental stages. So how do we develop transferable skills across different uh, career stages, I think is really vital. And then uh, also embedding capacity building into existing research projects. So research officers make great PhD students. First of all, they're being paid to work on the project, but they're also getting something out of it themselves. They're invested in it, and they become experts in that work. So it really is a good way of, of uh, building PhDs uh, in the context of doing research. And then finally, I'm going to finish off soon, and we can have some time for, for some discussion. Uh, it's very important to align what we do with uh, policy priorities. Engage policy <coughs> partners early, and embed your Ministry of Health partners in the annual meetings. Invite them if possible, and if they have the time to come to your meetings to talk about the research questions. Uh, many of them also have research expertise in their own right, and uh, so it's very, very important to, to And uh, we've had some successes in prime countries in our uh, various research, uh, in our various policy initiatives, which I can tell you more about if you're interested. So here's some uh, examples of embedding. <laughs> So these are our Ministry of Health partners in this is one of our annual meetings. This was in Uganda a couple of years ago. And they're very much a part of the group, very involved, actively involved uh, in the uh, research discussions and uh, in the work. Here's another meeting also in Uganda uh, where we had a really good involvement. This is uh, Sheila Ndianabanji, who's our Ministry of Health partner, who's been a fantastic champion for mental health in Uganda, uh, together with the principal investigator, Dr. Fred Kigorsi. Um, and uh, these are some uh, pictures from our Theory of Change uh, workshops in the South African site in the Northwest uh, Province. Uh, this is Professor Inga Peterson and Professor Arvind Barner, who are the principal investigators uh, in the South African site, and our Ministry of Health partner, Nambula Sivanyoni, who sadly <coughs> passed away about a year ago uh, due to cancer. Um, this is the uh, you get a sense of how these meetings work. These are all stakeholders gathered around the table. And Inga is taking everyone through the theory of change, pointing out all the assumptions along the way, making sure that everyone is clear, everyone agrees. Often they'll be very active in pointing out why a particular step can't be undertaken. Um, and that was a really, really constructive uh, part of this. 
So in conclusion, it really is an exciting time to be working in this field, and I think we really need to redouble our efforts to build and maintain partnerships across the North and South, and it's great to be at, at Duke uh, these last couple of days to talk um, about how this can be taken further. Um, and finally, I think it's really important that we build uh, capacity both in, in individuals and institutions, and I hope I've given you some uh, ideas of how that might work in practice. Thank you very much. to our funders, which none of us would be possible. So any questions or comments? In task shifting, are you, um, are you exposing the other non-specialists to some level of, um, of training that will allow them to Provide probably equal care or equal or better care? Yeah, that's, that's exactly the idea. So, the idea is, and, and it can take different forms. So, um, it can be, for example, training primary care nurses to detect depression and alcohol use disorders in primary care clinics. So, they may be running an HIV clinic. What are common signs of depression? And how would you identify someone with depression in your local? culture in your local setting, and what would you do with them? Would you be able to treat them yourself? Would you refer? Who would you refer to? So it's uh, both uh, skills development to manage that particular patient, but also um, uh, setting up systems to enable them to function better. And we've had to do quite a lot of work around looking at the way in which facilities function. So in the South African setting, uh, Inga Peterson and their team have <coughs> done what we call change management workshops, which is really looking at the way in which the whole clinic functions, and how cues are managed, um, and uh, how people might be identified in those particular clinics. So really some systems level change is really important. And then the final really critical part of this whole component <coughs> is going supervision. Uh, we found just <coughs> doesn't cut it really, it really doesn't work. So it starts a process and then the skills are pretty, pretty soon evaporated. Um, so we've had to work hard to set up ongoing supervision mechanisms and make sure that there is supervision capacity in place. And actually uh, Brandon Court from, from Duke um, has worked very closely with Mark Jordans in the Prime Nepal site to develop this ENACT tool which enables supervisors to assess the capacity of primary care providers to provide mental health care. And that's the kind of model that we try to do. Yeah. Um, great talk, Craig. Thank you. And I, I really liked the model that you set out showing the relationship between poverty and mental health. Yeah. And I mean, clearly that's so important. In your partnerships working across multiple sites, how is that, how is that received? Because yeah. it obviously requires, you know, it's oftentimes <laughs> different ministries working together yeah. or, you know, the poverty is so large to tackle particularly, you know, does the healthcare system want to take on that challenge? Yeah, yeah. How does that, what, what, if, what has your, been, your experience sort of really making that link and addressing that yeah. link across multiple sites? Yeah, it's a great question and it's something that's worked, you know, better in some sites than in others. So, for example, in the South African site, we've tried to link our psychosocial rehabilitation groups for psychosis with the Ministry of Social Development to try and improve access to social care grants. And that has worked you know, not so well in some instances and, and better in other instances. So one of our PhD students, Carrie Brooks Sumner, has written a paper on intersectional collaboration and maybe I'm really trying to go into the detail of that. Um, but you're right, if I can just um, <coughs> slide back up. <coughs> the way back. Um, <coughs> you know, and, and this is really where we're trying to go to next. I think effectively, um, effectively, a lot of our mental health care plans have focused on this uh, bottom pathway, which is really trying to provide treatment programs and improve detection to prevent a drift into poverty. Uh, where possible, we've, for example, in South Africa, we have social care grants for people with disabilities. We've tried to improve access to those and, and refer people. Uh, we've also tried to link livelihoods generation uh, with the basic needs program in, in uh, Uganda, in Kamuli. Um, but because of the way in which we focus, which is really working with ministries of health, we've mainly focused on this, on this component, focusing on the social drift. 
So, and, and this is the thing that I'm really interested in doing next, is looking at how do we, part, uh, how do we twin uh, poverty alleviation interventions like cash transfers, we were talking about this a bit last night, with uh, mental health interventions, and look at both mental health and poverty outcomes. And uh, I'm really interested in some of the cognitive and affective mechanisms which maintain or help to break poverty cycles. And so how do we target those specifically? Um, but that's uh, the next step. Yes, so I'm interested in your collaborations I mean, with the Ministry of Health and the government officials in particular. So a lot of the capacity building you've been highlighting is right, research capacity and clinical capacity. Yeah. The capacity of government officials to appreciate, understand how evidence is generated and then yeah. actually acting on that evidence. Yeah. In Tanzania, we've tried inviting them to research literacy workshops mm -hmm. and some of our projects with Sylvia Kaya and not just inviting them near the end for dissemination to try to get them engaged earlier. Right. I was wondering what other strategies you have for working with them. Yeah, we've, we've actually done more of that in the Emerald Project and you know linked it to Prime. So in the Emerald Project, we've developed uh, training workshops for policy and planning, mm -hmm. uh, which we haven't yet rolled out. Um, but those have been based on some earlier WHO materials that we developed to develop um, policy and planning cycles and how do you integrate mental health into those. Uh, we haven't yet implemented those. The, the capacity building at the district level is very much focused on the district health management team. So it's not really at the national level yet and Emerald focuses more on the national level. But I think certainly it's been a, it's been a kind of collaborative process of working together to develop these district mental health care plans. So there's been less kind of didactic teaching and more kind of learning on the job together about how we do this and how we strengthen the referral pathways, how do we improve access to psychotropic medications and so on. Um, but it's a great question because I think this is a, such a key gap for us in ministries of health in African countries especially. Well, some of it's been back, a back and forth of the Ministry of Health still not recognizing that mental health should be prioritized yeah. they feel like there's not enough evidence yet. And so just that, that conversation and trying to get district, regional, and national level yeah. groups involved. Um, point, yeah, I mean, that is a huge issue. At least in the prime countries, we've got national level groups <coughs> in all the countries, which is great. And, and in countries like Ethiopia and in Madhya Pradesh states and in India, it's been fantastic. I mean, they are now taking and I haven't spoken much about this today, but for the scale-up phase, um, the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia is taking these, this uh, SODO district mental health plan and scaling it up to the whole Garaji zone in southern Ethiopia. And the whole of Madhya Pradesh state is now brought into this model. So in some countries, a lot depends on policy commitment and uh, partnerships and key individuals who are there and supportive and building those relationships. Um, but that's a huge, huge gap, is, is building capacity to plan, really to evaluate services within ministries of health, not among researchers. Yeah. In this plan, how would you guys, or how would you, your team, anybody, make livelihood generation sustainable if there isn't like a lot of commerce in the area or there aren't job opportunities for people? And so if you were to set up a business or something, there wouldn't be money in the economy for people to go to that business and buy anything. Yeah. So how do you generate livelihoods without just giving people grants over and over again. Yeah, sure. So there's a, there's a really nice uh, model for doing this, which is an organization called Basic Needs. I don't know if you know of them, but I'd really encourage you to Google them and have a look. They've got projects in about nine different countries. So we've done an evaluation of their work in rural Kenya, in the Meru South and Meru North districts. Uh, and they have an amazing approach where they partner with local NGOs uh, to identify people living with severe mental illness, with uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression, uh, initially to get them diagnosed and on some form of treatment, but then to establish what they call user self-help support groups where people tell their stories, and those then become livelihoods generation groups where they develop particular skills in agriculture or starting a business or, or whatever it might be. And we've shown, you know, even in those very, very deprived settings, significant increases in both individual and household economic outcomes. Uh, from that program. So it's really about helping people in the local settings to map whatever local resources there are and build skills. <coughs> it's not adequate and I, I'm a firm believer that one has to have both active poverty alleviation interventions in terms of welfare grants or cash transfers together with mental health interventions. But uh, there is some quite compelling evidence that just providing mental health interventions alone <coughs> leads to economic outcomes. And we actually showed this in this, this Lancet review in 2011. 
is that the evidence for the effect of mental health interventions on poverty outcomes was better than the evidence of poverty alleviation interventions on mental health outcomes. Um, since you were working in such uh, different cultural contexts, were, were the treatment methods vastly different, and how did you navigate that or integrate that in the, yeah. into your work? So that's a really, really important question as well. <coughs> what we've been trying to do as far as possible is, is try and understand local idioms of distress and local terms that people use uh, for understanding experiences like depression. Um, so, uh, for example, in the AFFIRM trial, um, uh, quite a common word that's used in POSA is which means uh, thinking a lot or thinking too much. And so we've, we've used that in the counseling manual to help the counselors say, tell me more about this problem. Is it about, do you find it's like thinking too much? So uh, really using the local idioms of distress as much as possible. We've also spent quite a bit of time uh, testing and, and validating the counseling tools that we use. Um, a great example of this, which is not part of any of these collaborations, but it's the work of Dixon Chubanda and uh, his uh, project called the Friendship Bench in Harare and Zimbabwe. It's been funded by Grand Challenges Canada. And uh, they've uh, used uh, actually a similar term called Fufungi Sisa, which means uh, thinking too much. And they've developed a screening tool called the Shauna Symptom Checklist, which uses these local idioms instead of the Western terms like depressed mood or persistent sadness or uh, whatever those might be. So it's been an ongoing process. I, I think it's still a huge work to be done in this area. Is, you know, is how do you develop counselling in a way that's empathic, uh, that is respectful, uses local um, cultural terms, um, but helps people to address, uh, address the problems in, in a rigorous way. And one, one example, I was sharing this anecdote this morning when we had our meeting. Uh, in the AFFIRM trial, the counsellors uh, will often introduce themselves at the beginning of the first session and say, I'm from this clan in this rural area, this is my family, and they'll get the client to talk about where, where is their family clan, they'll talk about you know, points of connection. Now, in Western psychology, you don't do that stuff. You don't disclose anything about yourself. It's all focused on the client. And uh, I think that's really, really interesting because it builds rapport. Uh, and, and I think in the context of the Costa culture, it's quite alien to speak to a stranger about very personal problems. So building that kind of rapport is a really nice way of, 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 of uh, proceeding with the counseling. Uh, so really trying to adapt to local settings as much as possible. And there's also very nice work, if, for those of you who are interested in the AFFIRM trial, uh, Tandy Davies, who's doing her PhD, published a very nice um, paper in Transcultural Psychiatry just this year the sun is set even though it's morning, which is a phrase used by one of the Kosa women to describe her experience of depression. And she's tried to map all of these idioms of distress for depression uh, onto the ICD-11 and DSM-5 and look at the extent to which there's common and different differences um, in local experiences of depression. So have a look at that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about how there's sort of like a dearth of research for uh, child and adolescent psychiatric problems. Uh, can you go more into detail? Is that, is that is that because like the primary problem people focus on don't aren't, aren't what children suffer from in these uh, developing countries, or is it because uh, these systems that people develop sort of uh, miss out on the children? Who are I, I think it's more the latter. I think the child and adolescent mental health problems are, are the, the overall prevalence. I mean, again, there's limited evidence, limited epidemiological evidence, but I don't think there's evidence that those problems are even less prevalent in low and middle income countries than in high-income countries. In fact, because of some of the injury-related risk factors and other disease process risk factors, they may be more prevalent in certain circumstances. So it's more about the lack of priority in the local health systems for mental health care for children and adolescents. And I think also the lack of a prevention and a promotion approach to mental health across the life course. Now, we know that most mental disorders have their onset in childhood and adolescence, so it would make sense to intervene early, but we don't. We know that the demographic distribution in most low and middle income countries is far more weighted towards children and adolescents than in high income countries, yet we don't focus on it. So I think it's just a huge gap, it's an oversight, and it's, it's an area that can be explored uh, a lot more in development. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? One last question? Okay. All right, thank, thank you. Very thank much. you so much for all your interest.